Since the mid-70s, recognizing and realizing the long-running deceptions and pretensions of so-called ISKCON is integral to the process of overcoming them with your higher intelligence. Due to a combination of the time factor and human mortality, some of those deviations, still a minority, however, have merged into oblivion at this time, but most are still ongoing. Indeed, in living memory, there is the air quotes ISKCON narrative, and it requires our astute analysis. And that analysis, in order to be effective, must be free from the negative impact of mistaken knowledge. Freedom from Mistaken Knowledge will be presented to you in this month's podcast. There are important facts, ongoing as well as merged into the history, that you need to know. So-called ISKCON promotes a simple but wrong narrative, one shot through with mistaken knowledge, but you should be far more interested in the absolute truth than anything that cult has to offer to you. The air quotes ISKCON narrative is not conducive to liberation. The perfection of man is attainable and it should be the goal. This goal is constantly impeded by the Supreme Lord's Mayaka energy on every plane and from every angle We have to deal with it from every plane and every angle. Our physical bodies impose an identification against our interests, and these are impediments to the perfection of the self. Our astral bodies do this also, more or less at every moment. Our causal bodies are contaminated with root universal categories meant to increase contaminated consciousness. Fate, karma, vikarma, and svabhava, svabhava being the individual nature in the universe that has nothing to do with our eternal identity but with our temporary identification. These are some of those causal factors. Aside from these, there's Western culture at large, and it's completely anti-Vedic. There are all kinds of sensual desires constantly pushed by it, along with the many ethnics which identify with it, increasing to the point of nation-states. There is Western organized religion in general, all of which has no redeeming feature, but instead only negative value when it comes to achieving liberation from the cycle of birth and death, samsara. And then there's witchcraft, there's Satanism, Luciferianism, and various principalities that promote danger at every step for those who are their occult participants. However, worse than any or all of these binding factors, there are the many pseudo-spiritual religious organizations and the smaller pseudo-devotional cults for a number of reasons, important reasons. We emphasize exposing the latter. At this time, so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Ritvik are the worst of the lot. The largest of these cults is so-called Iskan, of course. Nevertheless, the total number of devotees still psychologically affiliated with Prabhupada's branch of Lord Chaitanya's Hare Krishna movement whether that affiliation is completely bona fide or otherwise, those total number of devotees now outnumbers the so-called ISKCON big cult deviation. Such was not the case in previous decades, but time changes things. As such, 
What is the, air quotes, ISKCON narrative? How does it rationalize all of its deviations from the orders of the founder Acharya? How does it explain its myriad book changes, for example? How does it rationalize the relatively short but highly malefic zonal Acharya scam of the late 70s and early half of the 80s? Until that was replaced soon afterwards, how does it justify the collegiate compromise, the second transformation of the movement? There were book changes to the perfect purports that Prabhupada produced while he was physically manifest. Beginning in the first half of the 80s, how does so-called ISKCON explain away those disastrous edits of Prabhupada's books? How does its narrative rationalize the Hinduization of the cult? How does it justify FTG? What kind of revisionist narrative can accomplish all of this? Not a bona fide historical narrative, you can be sure of that. There is a motto from back in the day, most of you have heard it, simple for the simple. It has its correct application, but when applied to the air quotes ISKCON narrative, it's really downgraded to simple for the simpletons. Air quotes, ISKCON leaders never take a lot of time to engage in apologetics since they see that as mostly a counterproductive engagement. They instead utilize simple rejoinders. If someone interested in it or on the fringe or a patron, someone who comes to the Sunday celebration or who is losing his or her faith in the organization, begins to ask too many questions. Air quotes, ISKCON leaders make a quick determination as to whether or not that person is redeemable. If his or her questions are probing too deeply, bail on that individual, as he or she will no longer buy into the air quotes this kind of narrative, at least not for very long. Let me give you one example of this from personal experience. The Vaishnava Foundation was incorporated in the late 80s. Membership was small, but interest in our organization began to pick up, especially as we were one of the first Krishna groups on the internet in the mid-90s. Our initial articles appeared at that time. One female devotee in New York City became interested after reading them. Early on in our exchanges with this devotee, she revealed her history. She had accepted a Ritvik initiation from one of Prabhupada's disciples at his temple near Tompkins Square Park in New York. She also described what went down for her in relation to the Shemahorn Iskan temple after she first contacted Ritvik philosophy, which raised doubts. She had come across a card inserted into one of Prabhupada's smaller books at a New York bookstore. Those books could then be found at almost all of the used bookstores in that metropolitan area. A Ritvik had inserted the card into the book, so she visited that temple and heard a lecture about Ritvik philosophy. It influenced her to some degree. However, she was still torn. She was an accomplished woman in her business field of expertise and made good money for her specialized and honed skills. She thought that the movement was one and that so-called ISKCON was that movement. Of course, by the 90s, such had not been the case for decades, but again, that fact is somewhat tangential here. The easiest saver for her was to make donations to so-called ISKCON. Previously, before she became disillusioned by it, she had been very active in the revolutionary counterculture of the 60s and was a member of a Marxist-Leninist group. 
She knew, therefore, the cutthroat infighting that takes place in political cults by experience. And she knew this when she came across Ritvik, so it did not surprise her that so-called ISKCON had competition. There was a lot of competition in all of those socialist and communist cults, especially in New York City. Arguably, she very soon became the biggest donor to so-called ISKCON, to its Shimmerhorn branch, the main temple there. She was a prominent patron and to some extent considered dedicated enough to be more or less taken for granted. Yet the new field for obtaining knowledge about what went down and why in the Hare Krishna movement was now made available to her via the Ritvik temple and the internet where she was prodded to ask some questions. There was a particular initiated disciple of Prabhupada. He was amongst the mainstays at that New York temple, and he was in charge of fundraising. Near or at the top of his list was the name and phone number of this female devotee we're talking about here, as she was, of course, living on the outside. They also had direct personal interface whenever she visited the temple. You could say it was a friendly relationship between her and the fundraiser, but it, of course, hinged upon her value in the form of her donations, which were significant. Periodically, he would give her a phone call and ask for a next donation for the next big project, which was always coming down the pike in one form or another. She did not, previous to a phone call that will soon be described, reveal to that fundraiser, who should be accurately described as an amped up, gung-ho, dyed-in-the-wool, ISKCON fanatic if there ever was one. She did not reveal to him that she had contacted the Ritvik counter-narrative and that she had also contacted our articles, read that information from the Vaishnav Foundation on the internet. All of this new reading had cast doubt in her on the air quotes ISKCON narrative, which up to that time she had been spoon fed. She had not yet joined Ritvik at the time of this phone call we're about to describe. She thought that the fundraiser could give her necessary answers to what she considered to be questions which merited comprehensive, intelligent responses. So the last time he called her to hit her up, she was respectful and began to ask her first probing question. Did he respond to it with a thoughtful answer? Considering that she had donated thousands of dollars to the Shemmerhorn initiatives, did she not fully deserve such a response? That is not what she received. Instead, he immediately hung up on her. He instantly, by the nature of her very first question, considered her to be no longer useful and no longer deserving any kind of answers to whatever follow-up questions would ensue. He quickly concluded, instantly concluded, that almost certainly she would no longer accept any of the air quotes ISKCON pabulum. Her line of work and her intelligence made it clear that she was anything but a simpleton. So simple for the simpletons would not be effective. Mr. Fundraiser was an ingrate to the max, but that's how the cult often operates. You either accept its simple answers, its simple explanations, and its simple rationalizations, which are allegedly there to eradicate all your doubts immediately, or you are cast into the darkness as a reprobate. If you do not simply accept, you are tossed out as an irredeemable. 
In the case of this particular woman, Mr. Gung Ho hung up on her as soon as it was concluded by him that she was overintelligent, wanting an answer to a sensitive question, and therefore no longer cannon fodder for so-called ISKCON what they're looking for. Let us now proceed to a concise description of the so-called ISKCON narrative. To reiterate, no figure in and around that cult, no one who begins to doubt, will be subject to receiving any in-depth discussion on any or all of this, but we're going to discuss it now. Anyone who would lose faith in so-called ISKCON is compared by those cult leaders to a broken china bowl by the upper echelons. If you know anything about a china bowl, if it breaks, if you drop it and it breaks, and then some expert puts it back together, it'll still never look like it originally did. So that's their viewpoint if you break away from the cult. Depending upon the circumstances, someone who was previously completely faithful in so-called ISKCON, who was, to use the common terminology, all in, but lost either all or some of that faith, they'll receive nothing. They'll receive nothing more than platitudes and presuppositions integral to the, air quotes, ISKCON narrative. And if those don't turn the trick, then they're discarded immediately, as was that woman we just described in New York. The so-called ISKCON narrative centers around the GBC. The GBC is to ISKCON as the hand is to its glove. The GBC is the power node of the cult. ISKCON is the brand or the label, but the GBC decides the ISKCON philosophy, its process, and especially its revisionist narrative. We need a major overview of all of this in the context of totalism versus totalitarianism. In making any such effective analysis, in coming to the right narrative, you're going to have to deal with the ecclesiastical weeds, and that's especially the case as far as the current version of so-called ISKCON is concerned. This was all quite predictable from the mid-80s onward. Since the deviation of 1978, and frankly even before that, the Governing Body Commission has kept a totalitarian grip on the movement and its members, reinforcing its utter disdain for free inquiry and disputation. It is not the postmodern definition and action of free speech in the West that is being referenced here by me. Such an idealistic definition of free speech can never be unfettered or countenanced in any sophisticated civilization. Yet criticism of a cult controlling body and its beneficiaries must always be tolerated in any legitimate spiritual institution, and that toleration must certainly be present when it comes from initiated Brahmins in Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement. A great movement is neither meant to be a completely open society nor a completely closed one under the thraldom of its own totalitarianism. Ideas and the speech which expresses such free inquiry cannot or should not be artificially smothered. All the devotees in the Krishna movement, especially the Brahmins, have spiritual rights, and those rights are a foundational principle. The right to make free inquiry, and if they see a flaw, the right to disputation in relation to that flaw. However, the vitiated GBC took all of that away, beginning with the imposition of the disastrous Zonal Acharya imposition. 
those few Brahmins who explicitly repudiated its impl implementation were persecuted to the point of ostracism and character assassination. The institutional reaction was against the spiritual sovereignty of each of those brave individuals. Individual spiritual rights are inalienable to the perfection of man. When fully liberated above and beyond all conditioning, any self-realized Brahman possesses automatically immutable sovereignty. Even previous to that, freedom of Brahminical expression must not only be tolerated by the institution, but indeed it should be encouraged. A Vaishnava is not a malleable party man with a blank slate, meant only to be molded by the controlling faction of an imposed culture. Selectively tailoring institutional consciousness is not the business of any genuine managing body of a spiritual organization. Contaminated consciousness or mistaken knowledge is to be determined by guru, sadhu, and shastra, not by governing body edict. The vitiated GBC was and remains the source of all past and current spiritual crises. All of these we continually observe and continually experience. They come in the form of a never-ending astral war imposed upon all devotees from decades ago, especially via internecine battles between so-called Iskan, Neomat, and Ritvik. When the vitiated governing body determines what is and isn't harmful speech or harmful assembly, I shall give you five guesses as to who are the beneficiaries of any such judgment and you won't need four of them. To determine the right side of the prophesied history of the Golden Age, we must have knowledge. Specifically, we must know how to separate fate from providence. Manipulation of the politics of consciousness, and that's engaged in by the governing body, who can deny that? Such manipulation does not produce that needed knowledge. Now, whether you realize it or not, the technocracy will soon replace the paradigm of Western nation states. And when it does, that will be a top-down, centralized government run by experts, not spiritual experts, but experts in technology. There's the dreadful possibility that the vitiated GBC could wind up as a religious cadre behind its curtain. We need to head this possibility off at the pass. We need to do that now, not at the time that the new paradigm starts to go down. Then it will be too late. A later and worse version of totalitarianism will then prove to be intractable for centuries along with the uncountable mega-atrocities it will seed and enact. Tatwamasi. Such a terrible event is not inevitable. Indeed, it will not have any chance whatsoever to transpire if we can extract the now-suppressed Golden Age from its current existential prison. Mostly forced into that prison by the rulers of today's, air quotes, ISKCON regime. The vitiated GBC is not the vanguard of the Golden Age. It is instead its suppressor. It is also the repository of a wrong narrative, which this month's presentation is designed to, at least in part, expose and expose in quite a bit of detail. The duty of a genuine GBC would be godlike, both in its composition and results, but that is entirely inapplicable 
when it comes to the vitiated GBC for the past many decades plus. We must endeavor to get rid of it in order for the fresh and perfect consciousness of the Golden Age to once again resurface and flourish according to the will of the Parmeshwar. That will, capitalized will, is the true path of real history, and that's the only narrative that should hold our attracted interest. In order for it to resurface, we must repudiate the pseudo-idealistic intolerance which masks itself as quote-unquote Prabhupada's GBC. It is no such thing. Culture must control politics, but that is not the case in so-called ISKCON, and it's not been the case for a very, very long while. The party men, the space cadets, the blind loyalists, the fanatics, and the kickmies in so-called ISKCON represent little more than an echo chamber of the first echelon manipulators who control them. The lower cult echelons lack the power to discriminate, in no small part, because none of them have ever been real Brahmins. They might have a thread, but that doesn't mean anything if the consciousness is that, not that of a Brahmin. As such, they act according to a bias response. For them, the concept of free speech, which is always to be afforded to real Brahmins, is a dangerous concept. They do not want it. They do not want to hear about it. They want freedom from such free speech. The vitiated GBC is all too happy to grant them their wish in this connection. Part of how it grants them such an ignorant desire is the false narrative of revisionist history that it feeds them about the movement's status and its past, and it's time to get past all of that, pun intended. Initially, the GBC engaged in some service related to curtailing the influence of four deviant leaders who then were given sannyas and dispersed to different areas of America. This event is not integral to the ISKCON narrative, however, and it's very little remembered. Now, on with a concise delineation of the warped ISKCON narrative. Along with its garden variety rationalizations put forth to explain away all of its brackish water. We do so from the standpoint of how so-called ISKCON and the GBC how those loyalists within those organizations view the events from the past and how they speak about them when they do speak about them, which they try to avoid doing. The centralization scheme of early 1972 by a quorum of the GBC, specifically eight of its first 12 members, was uprooted and rectified. This is according to the so-called ISKCON narrative. There was no lasting damage from that centralization scheme because the automatic self-corrective empowerment of the governing body worked to produce a return to normalcy. But please note, it left a stain. Of course, they won't say that. Remember, we're, we're giving here what we're, what we're giving to all of you who are listening to this. We're giving you the ISKCON narrative, how they rationalize which is certainly not my view. Beginning in late 1973, the decision by the GBC to approve the plain clothes pick produced a notable increase in both Lakshmi and book distribution for most of the temples, and on that basis alone, it was proven to be right according to our eyes. And then we come to the direction of management, the founding charter of the GBC in 1970, which even at that time was of little importance, and now it remains of little, if any, importance. The decision by the GBC not to hold scheduled votes, which are mentioned in the direction of management, to not hold those votes, 
those elections and re-elections, a replacement of commissioners, was also right. Although this vote, mandated every three years by the direction of management, was in the charter itself, the GBC decision not to hold that vote of all temple presidents in either 1973 or 1976 was the right decision, as per the judgment of the GBC. If it had held the vote, then it would have resulted in political disturbance and intrigue, and that's all it would have resulted in. That's how we view it. The GBC views it. That Prabhupada tossed out virtually all, if not all, of the GBC resolutions at the annual meeting in 1975 in West Bengal, that has no significance. He had the power to do it, and the ultimatum he gave connected to tossing all those resolutions out at the time was simply meant to firm up the resolve of the GBC. This is the GBC view, and it's the right one. It was only a test, and the GBC passed that test with flying colors. Although Prabhupada instructed that each GBC was to serve as his personal secretary for a month and then replaced by another one, that the GBC only observed this for a very short time is not in the category of disobedience. In Prabhupada's state of obvious emaciation in 1977, it would have been precarious to his health to have an ever-revolving door of personal servants. As such, the GBC decision was to allow TKG to be the permanent secretary to Prabhupada for almost the whole of that year, and that decision was not a mistake. Therefore, because of this governing body decision, TKG, on the Commission's behalf, was given unfettered facility by the GBC to make all decisions about anything and everything he wound up making in relation to Prabhupada's treatments. In late May of 1977, there was that cryptic exchange between two commissioners, TKG and Satsvarup and Prabhupada, the exchange comprised the, the essence of it. The essence of the exchange comprised less than two minutes of time, and it had four other GBC witnesses who didn't speak up. They chose not to speak up, although needed clarification was right there for the taking, but they didn't take it. Oh, but that's a side point. The transcript of that cryptic exchange, which proved to be integral, it was not circulated. It had to be pried out of the archives over two years later. But that was not an effort to hide anything, in our eyes. There was no deception involved in not revealing it. And there was no deception in calling it the appointment tape, when there were no appointments contained in it. But that's not a fault either. All of those commissioners in that room, numbering six, knew what Prabhupada's mood and intention were, and that's good enough, and it remains good enough to this day. The GBC was empowered to rightly interpret that exchange, and there was no need for the transcript to be circulated. We didn't need anyone else to interpret it. And there was no malefic intention in not allowing that transcript to finally surface to the devotees beginning in mid-1980, over two years after it transpired. That that all-important exchange was then merged into the appointment of 11 Ritviks less than two months later was what Prabhupada intended. And this can be known with certainty because the GBC says so and therefore its conclusion must be accepted. That the GBC believed Prabhupada would deliver on his statement, made by him during that meeting in late May 1977, separate from the cryptic exchange later in the whole of the meeting, that he would appoint gurus. 
that we believed that he would do so was a given. So therefore, that he only appointed Ritvix was his subterfuge or choice. He did not officially appoint them as actual gurus, not because they were not already spiritual masters, they were, but for his own reasons. He never made explicitly clear what was behind his decision not to appoint them directly as gurus, but the GBC knows why he didn't. Allegedly. The decision by the GBC not to widely circulate the letter written by TKG in July of 1977, establishing the Ritvik's system, re-establishing it, was at worst merely an oversight. The 11 men named at that time as Ritvik's in that TKG letter, which Prabhupada merely signed on a line called, quote-unquote, authorized. Those 11 men were not clearly understood or even discussed by the overwhelming majority of Prabhupada's initiated disciples as to what their status actually was. And that included even the Brahmins. It was not discussed. Yet this should not be blown out of proportion. It was neither important nor mandatory that that letter became well known or that it was analyzed. The movement got reinvigorated because new disciples were again being initiated, and that's the only thing that mattered. And that's the only thing that mattered at that time and at this time. The decision not to take Prabhupada out on Parikram, although he specifically requested it, Reed ordered it, was not in the category of disobedience. It was the GBC decision through its emissary, TKG, who was empowered to make it. Similarly, the decision not to inform all of Prabhupada's initiated disciples to come to him immediately in late 1977, all of them. That decision not to inform them of this order, made by TKG and engineered in America through the commissioner from Southern California, that's also acceptable. The GBC accepts it. It was not an, a decision meant to circumvent the order. Prabhupada's express orders to have his disciples come to him, they were overridden by the necessity of the Christmas pick. The Christmas collection would have been severely impacted if the vast majority, what to speak of all of Prabhupada's disciples, were informed of his end-of-life order and so, therefore, they never were informed of it, at least not at the time. Instead, the order was changed to having only two leading disciples travel to Vrindavan from each zone in America and Europe, although that wasn't carried out fully either. It really didn't matter at all, because the GBC decision to override the order was the right one. And besides that, the money flow was very good in late 1977. After Prabhupada departed physical manifestation in mid-November, that the aforementioned letter naming the 11 Ritviks was merged into a so-called appointment of 11 Diksha Gurus. Now that's a presupposition, granted. However, it's the one that the GBC approved of. Therefore, it's right. All leading men considered that Prabhupada had appointed the 11 to be eventually initiators. So, merging the July 1977 TKG letter with a later Diksha Guru appointment was nothing more than a recognition of Prabhupada's secret intention. The GBC knew what his intention was, and that's all that matters that the GBC did not interfere with Kirtan Ananda when he began taking Uttama Odhikari worship from his godbrothers and godsisters at Moundsville in late December 77. That's also the right decision, to believe that he should not have been confronted, although his 
unilateral action was independent of governing body edict, it was the right decision for an already dejected movement, reeling after Prabhupada left. If there had been a GBC confrontation with Kirtan Ananda, uh, let us mention here a confrontation which wound up only being delayed for a little over seven years, but if there had been a confrontation with Kirtananda at that time, it would have created conflagration for the ISKCON movement in 1978. That the GBC decided to send representatives to consult with Swami B.R. Sridhar in Navadweep during the period of the 1978 annual GBC conclave, that was also the right decision. The GBC itself approved of it as a resolution, with only one commissioner objecting. So that alone proves that it is what Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya wanted, that the GBC, when asked by Swami B. R. Sridhar as to what was the basis of its eleven designated men being Diksha Gurus, when it offered him the reply that it was because Prabhupada previously appointed them as Ritvikacharyas, then the Swami replied, quote, Ritvikacharya, then it becomes as good as Acharya, unquote. That the GBC accepted this Bengali bromide was within the wheelhouse of its scope and purview to make such a judgment, and this was already TKG's plan anyway. That the GBC then created exclusive zones for each of its initiating gurus, and that, according to the advice of Swami B. R. Sridhar, the Acharya of the Zone, was in the category of an unprecedented decision against the Shishtatra of Guru Parampara. Nevertheless, since the GBC made that decision, it was authorized and bona fide for the duration it lasted, after which it was jettisoned completely, condemned, and considered not actually bona fide, and then that was the right way, because that was the GBC edict, edict later on. That the GBC also agreed with Swami B. R. Sridhar's slogan, Mat Guru Si Jaga Guru, and that the GBC not only authorized but demanded that all of its eleven appointed initiating spiritual masters be seen and worshipped as Mahabhagavats. That was right for its time. This despite everyone in due course, all the devotees, coming to the realization that none of those eleven men were Uttamadakaris, light years from it. But the decision at that time to have them worshipped as such by all members of the ISKCON movement also meant that any confrontation with Kirtananda with his earlier unilateral action would certainly not have to take place because they acquiesced to him. As such, not confronting him in late 1977 and early 1978 did not have any major ramifications and repercussions if they had confronted him. And all of it was GBC sanctioned, so therefore no problem. That the GBC accepted Swami B. R. Sridhar's two tropes. One, quote, just put on the uniform and then you become the soldier, unquote. And along with that, quote, it is to deceive the disciple, unquote. That this is the way to conduct the transition from Prabhupada to the new gurus. That was acceptable to the governing body. They accepted that advice. The GBC agreed with such deceptions, which it then considered to be transcendentally authorized by higher authority. By implementing those ideas, the pretensions became bona fide throughout the movement. It did not matter if a guru was pretending to be on a level in which he was not, because if the GBC approved of such deception, which it did, then any pretension or deception in sync with that approval was automatically transcendental and pure. That the GBC chastised two of its zonal acharyas 
in late 1977 and 1980, removing them from being any longer initiating spiritual masters for the cult, that was within its power to do. That it could justify this corrective action, which was not approved of by Swami B.R. Sriar, leading to the schism of 1982, but that it could justify this corrective action and that the new initiates of those two gurus in particular, that it could justify this action for them. It did so by rationalizing that those two men had become, quote-unquote, spiritually sick. And we should all recognize that as an ingenious innovation. A spiritually sick guru, my goodness. That the GBC soon afterwards reversed this and gave those two men their zones back and their initiating status back. Uh, and if you want to know the reason for that, it's because one of them threatened to reveal the subterfuge behind merging the Ritvik appointment with the appointment of actual gurus, that it afterwards reversed the whole thing, was the right tactical move. That move was part of the overall strategy to keep ISKCON viable, otherwise it might create her as a death blow. As such, acquiescing to those two men and reversing their chastisement was the right tactic at the right time. Since the GBC did this, it is not in the category of a contradiction. While the period of chastisement was in effect, they were no longer gurus. Whatever the reason, once that punishment period was terminated, they are gurus again. That the GBC insisted from 1978 to 1982 that there could only be 11 initiating spiritual masters in the ISKCON movement was its rightful decision to make. That the totalitarian monopolistic zonal acharya concoction thus had to be terminated when ex it expanded its number of gurus, that's not a contradiction. Labeling the zonal concoction something unwanted and eliminating it simply proved that the GBC had, integral to its creation and ontological status, as we mentioned before, a self-corrective mechanism within it. Beginning with the Lichtenstein Gita in 1983, what about the massive book changes? One of my godbrothers counted 741 unnecessary changes to the translations and purports in that new version from 83. Were all of those corrections of obvious mistakes? Of course not. Now, there were some obvious mistakes in the 72 Macmillan version, some of them egregious. And remember, the 72 Macmillan version was Prabhupada's second Bhagavad Gita as it is. However, those mistakes were not in the hundreds, perhaps not more than 20 or 30. The changes from Macmillan to Lichtenstein 11 years later, and after Prabhupada had left physical manifestation six years earlier, cannot be easily dismissed for what they were and remain. How does the GBC explain all of this? Oh, the GBC does explain it. They have a very powerful rationalization. The GBC can and does claim that it has nothing to do with it because that Lichtenstein edition was authorized by the BBT, which is separate from ISKCON. The GBC controls ISKCON, but it doesn't control the BBT. The GBC is also separate from the BBT. The massive changes are not the fault of ISKCON, nor its controlling node. Case closed. What about the second transformation of the collegiate compromise? It was mostly ushered in by Ravindra Sarup and his like-minded comrades. It brought some gurus down, but not all of them. The Uttama worship was abandoned, but they made an exception. All remaining gurus, including the former great pretenders, were then considered madhyams, as long as they remained in the good graces of the GBC. All of their disciples were still considered genuinely initiated. The disciples of the gurus 
ostracized were not, however. Was the reinitiation mandate that the initiates of the other high flying gurus who did not acquiesce? Was that reinitiation mandate actually authorized? Or was it an awkward formulation? The GBC said it was right and that it would work, and that's good enough. Either way, it didn't last very long, did it? When some new people wound up accepting three or even four quote-unquote reinitiations from so-called authorized gurus, it was a time for a change. Once the Ritvik concoction powerfully surfaced in the early 90s, the reinitiation jig was up. The GBC adapted accordingly, however, which we always must presume that it will do. The new people have been jerked around by a carousel of musical chairs and initiations, but with Ritvik, they could simply opt out and claim they were initiated by Prabhupada. As such, the GBC tactically allowed the reinitiation scheme to merge into oblivion, and it was right in allowing that. Things had become too institutionalized during the second transformation. The new people needed charismatic pretender Uttamas. They needed them to amp them up. The GBC was responsible for ushering stage two in, and that turned out to jeopardize the revenue flow in the process of its formulation, formation, and implementation. Did it rationalize that error? Did it correct it? Uh, yes, it did. Replacing the collegiate compromise, the GBC approved the Hindu hodgepodge, which then, as the third transformation, replaced the previous one when it proved unworkable, not having the required revenue flow. Thus, the GBC is more than indirectly responsible for Hindu marriage ceremonies held in front of open ISKCON deities for years running. It's responsible for the Indian dance troops in the temple rooms. Were you not entertained? Did it continue to attempt to expand its Hindu congregation and the money they brought with them via absurd events like car pooge? Sure. Did Hindus then start to actually become temple presidents at some Western centers? Was the Bhaktivedanta Manor in order to attract its new congregation and win the crowd advertised as a Hindu festival in the papers? There is no question that the GBC allowed all of this to go down. How is any of it rationalized? How is FDG rationalized and justified? There can be no doubt whatsoever that the GBC fighting the right wing of the ISKCON bird of prey formulated, formed, legitimized, and implemented FDG. There may only be one such feminist represent now, but there will be more of them in the near future. Such a quote-unquote liberal initiation process is meant to win and expand the congregation. But is there alone value in such numbers? The GBC says that there is, and it has the sweeping explanation which covers everything we've already talked about. What is that sweeping explanation? It is the ultimate managing authority. It emphasizes the adjective to the max, and it dismisses the adverb. Whatever the GBC decides, it's bona fide at that moment in time, whether eventually reversed or not. Any GBC decision represents ultimate spiritual authority on every and all planes, and this is the essence of its sweeping explanation for everything in its narrative. You must stay loyal to the GBC because even when it deviates, it does not. 
The whole saga that it's created is nothing but a test. The GBC has a self-corrective mechanism integral to it. This is the sum and substance of the GBC. It's the sum and substance of its rationalizations, its concocted process, and its revisionist narrative. Have we listed all of the deviations engineered by the vitiated GBC for the last four decades? Probably not, but even if we have not, we've touched upon many of them. Can they be individually justified? Argumentum ad absurdum allows for that to a certain extent, as does their black art of slow walking the whole thing in order to keep kicking the can down the road. And the GBC has certainly mastered that sorcery. The colossal hoax, known as the fabricated so-called ISKCON Confederation, is a pseudo-spiritual scam. No one will ever be able to confront an ISKCON representative, be that representative an institutional guru, a GBC, a sannyasi, a temple president, or a combination of any of these, and question any of the points we brought up here. Of course, they can try that, but they can't expect any cogent and comprehensive answers to even one of them. The air quotes ISKCON narrative is what it is. Although it can vary according to who spouts it, from what angle of vision at any given moment, and to which person is asking its representative the questions. At this point, what else could you possibly expect from so-called ISKCON? Sadeva Samya.